Welcome to our lesson on the Peloponnesian War, and uh, I, I've been looking forward to this particular lesson for quite a while. Uh, this war really wraps up much of our study of Greek history, uh, brings to conclusion what we understand as uh, what I would say is the majority of independent Greek history. <clears throat> we will uh, maybe one day have the opportunity to explore Hellenic Greece and even Alexandrian Greece, but uh, in this case we're going to be wrapping up with this war and the immediate aftermath. The Peloponnesian War lasted from 431 to 404 BC. Now, it was not a civil war, and that was because each city-state fighting in the war was technically still independent and neither were attached to each other through political bonds or even really social bonds. So Sparta, Athens, and all of their allies, they were considered and they considered themselves independent city-states. And thus, during this war, they were fighting against each other as though they were nations, and really they were nations fighting against other nations. So don't confuse this with a civil war uh, because in a civil war that is a united country generally fighting against its, obviously fighting against itself with the intent to capture the other side's capital. And that is also why there are some other wars that have been called civil wars that are not civil wars uh, simply because a civil war is basically one country fighting, having an internal war with one force attempting to capture a capital of the main or let's say leading power. Now, none of the major leaders of the war at the beginning were in power at its conclusion. All of them had died or been exiled uh, throughout this 27 year process. So it took quite a toll on everybody and was uh, basically a very costly war for both sides. As I said, it was started by two minor allies of both sides, of both Sparta and Athens. And we should understand that in war, or that most wars are initiated not by the major powers, because oftentimes they realize that it's in their best interest to not go to war but it is often that they are drug into that war through the actions of their allies and those smaller powers who believe that they can go to war against each other and succeed. And what ends up happening is that the two larger powers are brought in. Now, ironically, the two minor allies would switch sides. So at the beginning of the war, uh, the the two main uh, fighters would go to their respective allies, say, we need support, and they would be declined. And so they would go to the other side's capital and say, we need help, and they would say, yes. So very unusual processes here. The primary war aim of Sparta was to bring Athens down, uh, to crush its empire and reduce it to a mere city-state like it had been and their call was freedom of the Greeks. It was to release the members of the first maritime league from that league and to enable them to have freedom from Athenian control and their imperial ambitions. Now the primary war aim of Athens is not wholly clear but generally intended to fight to maintain their status as an empire and leader in the region and remove Sparta from even challenging that status. So Athens was fighting to maintain the status quo while Sparta was attempting to change it.
Here we take a look at a picture. And it's important to understand also how this plays out in future history, future world history, particularly with the world wars and the Cold War. So you see in red, those are the allies of Athens. You can see also that there are blue places. Those are allies of Sparta. And the areas of gray were neutral. They, they took no side in the war. Now, one of the things which led to a lot of tensions and a lot of suspicion in the war and created the, I guess what you call hair or trigger, you know, the easily going to war posture of these two sides is that neither of them had any room for maneuver. A Spartan ally was right next to an Athenian ally who was sandwiched between another Spartan ally. And so with this jumble and mix of Athenian and Spartan allies, you can understand that neither side felt entirely comfortable or secure and was constantly needing some type of reinforcement. You can also see that neither side had any room for maneuver. There was, uh, they, they had basically split the Greek world evenly. And thus, it is very easy to understand why they could so easily go to war and why a war between two allies could start this because they had so many allies. It's not as though there were very many people who could intercede. Now, this map is a little misleading in as much that the area of gray that is along the Ionian Sea, those are areas of Greece that were largely unoccupied and did not have city-states, or at least city-states of consequence. So it is misleading to call that as neutral when that should just be green because, again, it just really does not represent an area that was fully uh, occupied or could have supplied a source of allies. However, on the extreme left, uh, the Sicilian states and the southern Italian states, they definitely were neutral and definitely did not support either side. And this will actually redound to Athenian embarrassment and problems in the future because, again, they were neutral. They did not favor Sparta. They did not favor Athens. And yet later on, Athens, in the middle of the Peloponnesian War, will attack Syracuse, which is in southern Sicily. And this will actually drive all of those Sicilian states and all of those southern Italian states who were formerly neutral into the Spartan camp. Uh, they felt it was totally unworthy and totally unjust to be attacked when they had no interference and no position in the war. And that is true, even in the modern world wars, people create, sides often create more trouble for themselves by attacking uh, countries or peoples who are neutral and once they are attacked, they're like, uh, okay, you don't respect our neutrality, so we're going to join the opposite side. We're going to become unneutral. <laughs> and this is what Athens does. And from the time of the Syracusan uh, war and the defeat, the Athenian defeat at Syracuse, the war goes terribly for Athens and really eventually leads to their destruction. So we see here a rendering of how Athens and Sparta looked militarily at the outbreak of the war. Athens was very dominated by triremes. Uh, they had over 200 triremes, which they could fully man and equip. They had a very small army, really no army to speak of. Their soldiers did not really go out and practice. They had very minimal qualifications and they were continued to be largely 
volunteer based and thus not very well trained. However, Sparta was exactly opposite. And I made these soldiers much bigger because not only did Sparta emphasize and have pretty much exclusively land forces, but Sparta was the ultimate military society. Their men slept in barracks. They had to sneak out at night and actually try. It was a competition to be able to go back to your home and spend the night with your wife. Uh, otherwise, you were in the barracks, you ate with the other men, you, you ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and whatever else with the other men. It was a highly militaristic, firmly trained society in which the men constantly prepared for war. I mean, they basically ate, slept, and uh, woke in a state of war. And uh, so their army was vastly overprepared in many ways. And one of the reasons for this was to keep the, keep the Messonian helots at bay. Now, some of their allies did possess triremes. And so that's why I did include one trireme here because they did have to have a navy. They did have to have something of a force in order to conduct business and to do trade and ensure mobility, but that was not their primary objective. So why did the war last from 431 to 404? Well, again, going back to what I just said, uh, it was just a real imbalance. Periclean, so we talked about Pericles being a leader in Athens for 80 years almost, uh, Periclean strategy was to avoid direct military confrontation and fight mainly through seaborne raids on the coast and avoid pitched field battles. So he knew they had a weak army but had a very strong navy. So he would send them out to coastal cities or farms that lay on the coast and attack them, burn them, raid, pillage, plunder, and then go back to the ships and sail away. And that was his only strategy. And he, he said, hey, if you do this, uh, we will succeed because the Spartans will never develop a navy and will never have the discipline like we have to uh, carry out a seaborne strategy. That ends up being completely wrong. Uh, Sparta, by the Athenian defeat, approaches uh, by the Athenian defeat in, at Syracuse, approaches Persia and says, we want ships, we want men, and we need money to do this. And the Persians are all too happy to supply this money. And so they pitch in and Sparta develops a navy that even though still keeps losing every almost every naval battle that they engage in, uh, Eventually, they win. Sparta loses a lot of battles, but they win the most important ones. Uh, so they win the Battle of Ajo Spotmai on the Persian Byzantium coast, and they win the war. Uh, definitely putting proof to the Periclean strategy. Now, Spartan strategy at first was, as I just said, to avoid open ocean clashes, given that they had no navy, and attack the Attica region by burning farms, villages, and homes, but not by attacking Athens directly. So you have the two mutually contradictory strategies meant that the first two, three years of the war were very indecisive as the two armies, the two forces never really made direct contact, they never even really saw each other. While the Spartan army was outside Athens, the Athenian navy was along the Peloponnesian coast. So the two never really had a chance to clash together and make an effective uh, chance at fighting. Now, Pericles would die in the second year of the war due to an Athenian city-state pandemic. 
And I use that word very specifically. Uh, in the first year of the war, they had gathered everybody inside the walls of Athens and the Piraeus. They had let the Spartans raid and burn down their villages and their farms and their homes. And when the Spartans got tired of wreaking havoc in the fields and went home, the Athenians went out again and replanted and rebuilt. So next year, here come the Spartans again, same strategy, and Pericles says, let's all gather back into the city. Nobody really knows exactly what it was, but they do believe it began in the Piraeus area, which is a port area. But somebody brought some kind of sickness in. And the sickness was characterized by an extreme fever, cough, blisters on the skin, which would eventually explode. And so there'd be blood and pus that would bleed out. And the overall result is that because of the fever and the pain, you would go into a state of delirium or even uncontrolled spasms. And so you tended to just basically melt. And what was even worse is that there are some instances in which people suffering from this deep viral infection and this plague would fall headlong and jump into the water supply. So you're drinking from a well and someone jumps in and they die and you just keep on drinking and then you get that sickness as well and it passes along. Pericles would die in this plague and hundreds of thousands of Athenians would as well. And the death toll from the plague was so immense that Athens could not man, they could not totally crew all of the triremes that they had. So they had 200 triremes, but they did not have enough trained or even strong enough or mature enough men to put crews on these 200 ships. And if you see how small a trireme really is, you will realize just how serious uh, a pandemic this was. And it only took one or two people to bring this in and just wipe them all out, basically. I mean, Athens could have lost the Peloponnesian War there and then, and we would be talking about an entirely different outcome but it evaporates and it slowly goes away just in time to leave kind of a rump population and enough people to continue on the war, but in very different circumstances. So again, uh, primary figures of the war, we've talked a lot about Pericles, so I'll skip him. Cleon followed Pericles as a leader of Athens, but was regarded by Thucydides and I believe even Xenophon as very self-serving, ambitious, and ready to do unwise or even potentially illegal things in order to accomplish his goals and satisfy his ambition. So he was a corrupt bureaucrat, politician, not like those haven't ever existed in our own time. <laughs> Uh, we have Brasidas, who was really the best Spartan general, generally thought to be better than Leonidas or Cleomenes. Uh, he led Sparta to several victories and even attacked Athens' main support line, the aforementioned Piraeus, at night. Uh, he was very bold, very ambitious. He's the kind of leader that defines what it was to be Spartan. If there was any Spartan who actually measured up to the ideal of a Spartan, it was Brasidas. And he is a figure that I have studied and looked at uh, quite often, and I find a lot of inspiration from him. And I think that many others would. We get to Alcibiades. Um, Alcibiades was a major Athenian statesman who played a significant role in events starting in 415 BCE when he vigorously supported the Sicilian expedition, which was a defeat at Syracuse. Alcibiades was young. He was 
probably in his 20, late 20s, early 30s, when he really fully emerged in Athenian politics. But he, not only was he young, but he was also wealthy, ambitious, and aggressive. And uh, this led to a lot of excesses. And he lived a very immoral lifestyle. He uh, abusively drank alcohol, was engaged in multiple extramarital affairs. Uh, when his wife tried to go and divorce him, he actually picked her up in the courtroom and drug her out of the courtroom uh, to his home. Uh, he was accused of a very scandalous crime. He, he basically pushed things a little bit too far at one point and was recalled. Now he had sailed away. He was going to a war, to a battlefield, and the Athenians were so angry that he had committed this particular crime that I cannot go into with this class. But uh, let me just say it was an immoral crime. And uh, when they arrested him, they were trying to take him back to Athens and he was able to escape. Now, Alcibiades was about as anti-Persian as you can get. And he was fully anti-Persian. And in many ways, I believe that he wanted to finish the war with Sparta so he could start another war with Persia. And yet he ultimately ends up fleeing to Persia in order to be safe from the Athenians. Then once he runs afoul and commits some stupid stuff with the Persians, he leaves Persia and goes to Sparta. So he's gone from one enemy to the other and he's advising these uh, erstwhile or former enemies on how to win the war and how to conduct the war against Athens. Well, the Athenians get wind of this and uh, it doesn't make him any more popular uh, at Athens, but he manipulates events and things to where he is able to eventually return to Athens. But again, following form, he squanders even that good will of the Athenians and he has to flee one more time and ends up living on the coast near Age of Spotenmai and is witness to the last real full battle of the Peloponnesian War. Personally, watching this war end near the front door of his house. Uh, it's quite amazing. Aegis II uh, succeeded his father Archidamus, who had begun the war as one of the kings of Sparta in 427. And Aegis II will lead, to, will lead several invasions of Attica and serves as commander at the Battle of Mantinea in 418 BC which is a fairly spectacular Spartan victory. Like I said, Sparta lost far more battles than they won, but the battles that they won were all of the very significant battles that they needed to win in order to win the war. Um, a fascinating juxtaposition. So what were the results of the war? Well, Athens loses the war and has its democracy replaced by a group of 30 men called the 30 Tyrants. And they strip away every sense and symbol of democratic government that is there. After about three, five years, the 30 Tyrants are overthrown and democratic government is restored. Now at this exact same time, since Sparta has won and removed the Athenian government, they gain le leadership in Greece again, but they end up going to war with several city-states. And this idea that they began the war with, with this idea of freedom for the Greeks is totally challenged by what they do. And so eventually all of Greece gangs up against Sparta and they're attacked and they lose their government basically. And not only does Sparta lose a war, but they 
lose control of Messenia and the Helots, who we've talked about as being their slaves and their chattel slaves. And so once the Helots are freed, uh, Messenia becomes an independent city-state again. And what happens is Sparta is not able to reemerge as a leading power in Greece because she's being pinned down in this kind of military social standoff with Messenia. At that time, Athens temporarily reclaimed its leadership and almost became another empire. But when the allies who formed the Second Maritime League realized that she was trying to reconstitute her empire, uh, they got together and they attacked Athens and stripped it of its navy and almost stripped of it, it of its democracy. So what came around was going around. Now Athens uh, was soon eclipsed by the emerging power of Macedon and Philip II of Macedon and Alexander. Now during this time, there was a lot of frustration from the Persians with both Athens and Sparta. During the Peloponnesian War, Athens and Sparta had continually on and off approached the Persians for funding, ships, crews, all kinds of things. And at first the Persians were very happy to give to both sides, kind of hoping that the war would exhaust both of the city-states, would bring them into a, a type of exhaustive peace. You know, they'd have to give up fighting because they couldn't keep going. But that's not what happened. Uh, they just kept going and going and going. And so, Persia began to in place embargoes, began to threaten a second invasion or third invasion and kept saying, look, if you don't stop fighting, we're going to intercede and impose a peace on you and make it so that you have to stop fighting. Uh, so Persia, they're not so much interested in taking Greece anymore for the territory. They just simply want peace on the borders of their empire. And they're getting so tired of this, they're ready to, you know, they're basically telling them to knock it off. I remember one time my brother and I, we were fighting all the time and my mother just basically said, look, I'm going to do something and one of you is not coming back from it. So stop fighting or face consequences. And from that time on, we stopped fighting. For Athens and Sparta, it really took continual fighting and exhaustion to stop fighting. And eventually, Philip II of Macedonia would impose that peace that, that the Persians were seeking. And that peace would be peace through conquest. Uh, 